The skeleton soldier is dying, having failed to protect his owner, Mr. Succubus, who lies bleeding next to him. A soldier decapitates him, and his skull rolls to her corpse. Hoping he could have been stronger and wishing for a second chance, the skull rolls and bites a soldier on the foot before being smashed. As all fades to black, assimilation rate decreases to 94.8%. The skeleton muses on his failure and wishes to rest, being disturbed by an ever louder sound before waking up inside of a coffin in a forest. As he starts to recognize the place, a blue status window pops up, informing that the inheritance is complete making him a level 1 skeleton with the stats of a level 36, with no name. His thoughts are interrupted by a woman named Rubia claiming she had woken him, and realizing it is the same woman who made him into a skeleton soldier 20 years ago. He realizes he is back to when he first rose. He knows Rubia will soon be killed by bandits, and after some thought, remembering his dead master, he decides to save her and carries her away, finding no point in living if he can't even protect her. A scenario window appears, displaying information on Rubia just before two horsemen approach, prompting No Name and Rubia to hide. One wields a crossbow and the second a great hammer. And No Name realizes they weren't random bandits, but the mercenaries hunting Rubia. After they pass, Rubia starts to explain who she is before being shot by the crossbowman. As the great hammer user approaches Rubia, No Name strikes him in the head with a rock. But the man recovers and deals him a crushing blow to the skull with his hammer causing him to die again and fail at protecting Rubia. He then wakes up again in the coffin, while Rubia announces herself, much to his confusion. No Name has been raised again with his memories intact, and now faces a memorial window, offering him a bonus of 20 plus goodwill with necromancers or 40 plus blunt resistance. Choosing the latter, he tells a surprised Rubia to hide before the mercenaries arrive, causing her to wonder how he can talk and know this. He then asks for her dagger and vows to protect her as she hides. The mercenaries approach and spread to search for Rubia, and No Name is able to ambush and kill the unassuming crossbowman, leveling up before being smashed in the skull by the Great Hammer user. Though the damage was mitigated by the bonus, it was still too much. The mercenary wonders if there was a dungeon nearby, and proceeds to smash No Name to dust, killing him a second time. As No Name rises again, he applies the points he gained from killing the crossbowman to raise his agility. In his third life, he manages to kill the Great Hammer, but he was killed by the crossbowman. Finally, having gained more experience and levels, he is able to overcome and kill both mercenaries in his fourth life, succeeding in protecting Rubia after three deaths. As he walks with Rubia in a cave, No Name recaps his situation internally. Every time he dies, he goes back to when he was first summoned, starting at level 1 but retaining his skills and stats and receiving a memorial bonus. And if he experienced something different in his previous life, he gets a new ability. However, he doesn't know how many more times he can revive. Rubia pulls him from his thoughts explaining that she is the daughter of Lord Ray, an honest and principled man who resisted the new changes imposed by the newly ascended, warmongering king. For this, he was assassinated, leaving Rubia orphaned. No Name recalls that the king will soon launch a massive nine-year-long war to unite all the lands under his rule, followed soon after by the resurrection of the 16 devils. He lacks the power to stop this war, but at least he can protect this girl who's been caught in the middle though he must become stronger in order to do that, and one day, meet his mistress. They agree that they should get to a village and emerge into the mountains. Though Rubia attempts to play with him, No Name points out that skeletons are usually emotionless. They are headed to Yublam, and Rubia suggests buying armor there to hide No Name's nature in order to avoid panicking the humans. She is then saved from slipping to her death, being glad at having No Name there to protect her. After crossing the mountains, they finally reach Yublam, and Rubia decides to enter the town alone while No Name waits outside in order to avoid scaring anyone. She reassures him about her safety and promises to return soon. No Name waits patiently for three days wondering about her, and on the third day a door opens as an old man emerges from the castle with a wheelbarrow and dumps something. Memories of his time with Rubia flash through No Name's mind as he approaches her beaten corpse. Looking down at Rubia's corpse, No Name laments failing to protect her as he hears two men approaching. They were Rubia's jailers, and state that she committed suicide before they could sell her, causing their superior to beat one of them. One of them departs while the other searches for the corpse, dropping his sword once he finds it and promptly being stabbed from behind with the blade by No Name before he can do anything else. When questioned, the man reveals that the owner of the inn brought the girl to them, and they were following orders from the leader of the guards, after which No Name runs him through. Closing Rubia's eyes, he decides to look for the owner of the inn. That night, No Name approaches the inn, his body covered by a cloak, and kicks the owner inside.
cowering, the man yells that he doesn't know anything regarding the two dead organization members who had been sent after the daughter of the Lord of Erst, as he confused No Name with someone else. No Name then informs him about Rubia's fate and interrogates him as to its cause, stabbing him through the thigh before he can escape. Terrified, the innkeeper states that he merely handed the girl over to the guards, unaware of what would happen, because the leader of the guards has to give girls over to the Necron Society to use as slaves. Before he can say anything about the society, the snake tattoo in his neck comes alive and strangles him. And No Name concludes that there must be something going on between the Necron Society and the Ublom guards. Knowing he must become stronger and remembering Rubia's advice, he dons a suit of purple plate armor. Determined not to lose anyone else, he departs. No Name slices through another skeleton soldier as he enters the Spectre's Charnel House dungeon. It's a small dungeon, and upon realizing that it has fellow skeletons, he removes his helmet and attempts in vain to connect with them, thinking on how pitiful it is to be unable to talk. As he's about to depart, an alert window pops up informing him of the incoming dungeon boss, and he turns around to see a giant, horned skeleton armed with a war mace. The boss smashes one of the dungeon skeletons and beckons the rest to attack No Name, who dons his helmet and engages in combat. He easily dispatches the minor skeletons, dodging the boss's attacks and shattering one of his legs before taking a hit. Knowing of a skeleton's weak points, he then rushes and clamors atop the boss's skull, thrusting his sword and delivering a killing blow. This kill leveled up No Name five times and caused a quest window to pop up, promising a level 1 swordsmanship for swinging his sword 10,000 times. He reasons that, not having to eat or sleep, he can complete that quest easily, and decides to use the now vacant dungeon as his training ground. Outside the dungeon, a portly knight approaches accompanied by two beautiful women, one redheaded and another blonde. No Name continues to swing his sword, managing to raise his count considerably, when an alert window pops up and informs him of the presence of intruders. The portly knight boasts of his power to his female companions, with the redhead playing dumb as he shows her a bag full of expensive healing potions. She is clearly playing the knight, while the blonde woman muses on the situation, concluding that the knight has valuables and the redhead is just trying to get closer because of it. The blonde, whose name is Rena, plans to use the distraction of the monsters to kill and rob the knight. But as she leads him on, the redhead points out that, being an adventurer, Rena should take point and do reconnaissance, much to her annoyance. The knight attempts to break the argument, while inwardly lamenting that the dungeon only has weak skeletons and hoping to face a more resilient boss in order to show his cool side and get lucky with both women. Both of these women then point out they should have encountered skeletons by now, which the knight brushes off while inwardly wondering the same thing, until they stumble on the deceased boss and soldier skeletons. The knight is shocked at finding it dead, and just as a frustrated Rena is about to stab him in the back, they are surprised by No Name advancing in full armor. The knight confronts him and scoffs at the redhead's suggestion that it might be a monster, while Rena wonders if it's a skeleton. No Name then bids them to leave as he has taken over the dungeon, prompting the knight to agree while sensing that his opponent has a higher level than himself. As the knight tells the women they should leave, Rena lashes out at No Name for seizing the dungeon and for his manners in not removing his helmet, telling him to surrender his loot or else face the knight. The latter, besotted with Rena, tells No Name to reveal his face and a smirking Rena muses to herself on taking his stuff too, before all three are frozen in shock at finding out he's a skeleton. No Name tells them to leave, and while the redhead realizes that he might not be an average skeleton, the knight dismisses this, and, despite No Name's advice not to, prepares to fight. Trying to show off, he attempts to strike No Name with his blessed morning star, but the latter, having warned them to leave, slices his hands off before he can deliver the blow. Rena is enthralled. As the knight groans in pain, the redhead attempts to flee, before Rena kills her in cold blood with a throwing blade. No Name, believing he was the intended recipient, prepares to fight Rena before the latter asks to be spared. She introduces herself as a member of the T&T Guild, a thieves' guild carrying out assassinations, thefts, and information gathering, and she offers her services to No Name. She states that the redhead was her intended target since it would be troublesome for No Name if she got away, and she saved him the trouble of dealing with that woman. No Name, who was not planning on killing the redhead, asks Rena the reason for killing her colleague, to which she replies that she believes he cannot be killed through trickery and that she was her target. No Name then tells Rena to leave and refuses her offer of services, until he recalls that she also deals in information. He asks her about the Necron Society. Rena, glowing at the chance, states that she knows about them and will share the information on one condition, causing No Name to draw his sword. Rena, however, retorts that he would find it hard to find out what she knows without being from the guild, and the guild would not sell it to a skeleton, implying that killing her would prevent him from getting the information he needs. 
As No Name sheaths his sword, Rena states her condition is that he make her his ally, causing a quest window to pop up detailing the scenario. It presents the perks and warnings of trying to appoint Rena as branch manager of the TNT Guild. No Name thinks on how he still doesn't understand the meaning of these windows or assimilation percentage, but he still needs information. Rena keeps trying to persuade No Name, suggesting she might help with his training, before he lifts her by the neck, pointing out how easily she killed a fellow human and that he doesn't wish to be backstabbed himself. She then screams that she's more like him, and released states that humans are only interested in her body, not who she is inside, and they don't think of her as a human, just as they see No Name as a monster who needs to be slain, implying that they're in the same boat. Rena then explains that the Necron Society is a massive shadow syndicate, involved in drugs, contract killing, human trafficking, and other lucrative, illegal activities. It is also backed by several lords and powerful individuals in the Empire, though no one knows where their headquarters are or who leads them. Any further information is reserved to high-ranking guild members. Rena then proposes to bring her targets to No Name's dungeon so he can earn sufficient experience. In exchange, she will rise in the guild and be able to deliver information No Name desires. Hesitant, No Name asks her again if she won't hesitate in helping him kill humans. She confirms, stating that she hates them. He then agrees to the deal. An alert window informs that three intruders have appeared in the dungeon. No Name easily dispatches one of them and Rena assassinates the second, before the third kicks her to the ground. Before the third intruder can deliver the killing blow, No Name saves her. After the encounter, No Name's dungeon affinity rises to 19% and his swordsmanship reaches level 4. After months of doing this, his rate of leveling has slowed down. As he considers moving to a new dungeon, a delighted Rena shows him the loot they gathered from all the people they lured. Noting his uneasiness at her eagerness to kill humans, she points out that since the people she gets contracts for are criminals, she gets little money from this, while the criminals avoid getting punished for their many crimes through bribery and they all deserve to die. No Name notes the books the criminals carried, picking up a volume titled The Unsightly Mage. He starts reading that mages must possess an innate ability to cast magic, and though they enjoy great privilege, they have no responsibility. He wonders if the writer has a grudge against mages, and upon reading his name, Kevin Ashton, out loud, a blue window pops up informing him that his wisdom has risen by one point, much to his surprise. He then rummages through the other books, noting that a second book written by the same author also raised his wisdom when he read it. Meanwhile, Rena had been getting ever closer, making him uncomfortable. Having observed him, she offers to find more books for him in the village, but No Name asks her about the closest dungeons instead. As she recalls, there's one E-class, one D-class, and two C-class dungeons within a week's travel on foot. No Name thinks that since the current dungeon is an F-class, an E-class dungeon would be a good next step. He then notices that Rena has fallen asleep on his lap, and as he's about to resume his swordsmanship training, he suddenly feels tired and falls asleep himself. A blue window then pops up. Having spent 182 nights in the dungeon, his dungeon affinity is 20%. He is succumbing to his human nature, and the dungeon is trying to devour him. As No Name opens his eyes, he sees his deceased mistress Succubus, who asks him if he had a good dream, apologizing for waking him up. A shocked No Name jumps to his feet and realizes that he has no armor, being embraced by Succubus. She points out he must have had a nightmare, asking what story she should tell. A relieved No Name reassures himself and thinks that they will live in the dungeon happily for a long time as he is dragged by the hallucination deeper into the caves. Rena wakes up, finding herself alone, wondering where No Name went. Meanwhile, he is deep in his hallucination, lying on Succubus's lap while she reads to him, and starting to believe that everything prior had been a dream, relieved that his mistress is alive. Noting his unease, she closes the book and asks if the story is boring, then tells him to continue talking about his dream and what kind of person Rena was. Outside the dungeon, Rena stretches and realizes No Name isn't out there, and suddenly she notices troops nearby and an officer rallying them. They are there to subjugate the dungeon since, despite supposedly being a light training area, over the previous months, countless adventurers and civilians have disappeared after heading there. And this is the Blue Lion Templar's subjugation. Rena realizes the danger. In the dungeon, Succubus comments on Rena's lively attitude to No Name, and then she asks if he's just gonna let her die just as he left her. This startles No Name just as an alert window informs him an intruder has appeared. Recalling Succubus's death, he is determined to prevent the knights from killing her again. Rena approaches him, warning of the impending danger, but an entranced No Name rises and draws his sword, believing he is protecting Succubus. A worried Rena dodges his attacks and tries to reason with him while also thinking he has been acting strange, as a scout fires a bolt at her feet and alerts his fellow soldiers. 
calling No Name a monster and her a rumored witch. Rena notes that No Name is not in the right mind and begs him to come to his senses as crossbow bolts rain around her. Lost in his hallucination, No Name tells Succubus of the impending attack and vows to protect her, causing her to doubt it as Rubia appears before him asking why he left her to die. No Name falls back in disbelief as Rubia reminds him of his broken vow. Succubus then tells him he failed at protecting them because he was weak, and both rebuke him for his failure as he sinks deeper into despair. Outside, a soldier approaches the Blue Lion Templar and informs him that the scouts have located their targets. As No Name sinks deeper and deeper, he wishes he were stronger. In the dungeon, Rena takes cover from the bolts, and noticing No Name's state, decides to act. Using a smoke bomb as cover, she grabs No Name with a rope and makes a run for it, planning to lure them deeper into the dungeon in order to escape. She is stopped as a blade grazes her shoulder, soldiers barring her path. Their leader arrests her on suspicion of murdering multiple adventurers and promises to put her on trial. He also accuses her of necromancy as well as he notices the entranced and speechless No Name rise and orders his men to take the monster out first. Meanwhile, No Name's senses fade as he sinks deeper and deeper, concluding that that must be the afterlife and glad that he met Succubus and Rubia one last time. However, upon remembering that he should have been resurrected if he was dead, he realizes this is an illusion and that he must wake up. He must get stronger to protect Succubus 20 years in the future. He is a skeleton warrior who protects his mistress, who will protect everyone. No Name wakes up to Rena's bloody face. She stood between him and the soldiers and received three arrows to her back. A startled No Name picks her up as she jokes about hearing his thanks if they survive. The commander berates his soldiers, since their orders were to capture Rena alive, and noticing No Name carrying her, tells her to give up, just as she grimly lights a fuse. The commander watches in horror as the lit fuse burns towards a stockpile of munitions that Rena describes as her going away present. The exploding stockpile is revealed to be poison smoke, and Rena asks No Name to carry her on his back as they escape. Any soldiers that get in his path are swiftly cut down, and he asks Rena why she remained despite that number of soldiers. She replies that she is his ally, causing No Name to inwardly lament being caught in the illusion. As they leave the dungeon, No Name is relieved at not seeing any other soldiers. He is about to break the shafts of the arrows on Rena's back, before seeking more treatment elsewhere. Before he hears the Blue Lion Templar stating that reports of Rena being a high-ranking necromancer were exaggerated, before swiftly striking No Name down with his sword. No Name falls, his arm severed by the Blue Lion Templar's blow. The Templar looks at his foe with contempt and asks a surprised lord the reason for wasting his time to capture a weakling like Rena. The Lord explains his belief that she was a powerful necromancer, only to be paralyzed by the Templar's death stare. He attempts to end his life as payment for his sin before the Templar orders him to stop. Having somewhere else to be, he starts to depart, leaving Rena for the Lord to punish at his own discretion after her trial. Suddenly, he turns to face a risen no-name who wonders who the Templar might be, noticing how he didn't sense him or see him swing his sword and realizing he's on an entirely different level from all the opponents he has faced so far. No Name wonders if he can win, but seeing the wounded Rena decides that it doesn't matter since he will fight regardless of who he's facing. The Templar dodges his attack, and as the Lord insults No Name for his insolence and orders the recently emerged soldiers to help, a rumble is felt. An alert window pops up, informing a puzzled No Name that the higher level Blue Lion Templar has used an advanced skill restricting his mobility, as well as that of those in the area. With everyone immobilized, the Templar approaches Rena, wondering how No Name can move while she lost her consciousness and noting she doesn't look like a high-ranking necromancer. But if he were right, killing her would be beneficial. As he draws his sword to strike, No Name forces himself to move and attempts to attack him, though the Templar dodges the strike and breaks his sword. Noting that the reports weren't completely wrong, he strikes the final blow to the kneeling No Name, killing him for the fifth time. As darkness descends, No Name thinks about Rena and his failure to protect her, comforted only by the thought of going back to the grave in the forest and to see Rubia again. However, he awakes in the dungeon, deeply perplexed at the situation as he recognizes his surroundings and sees Rena sleeping on his lap. The status window informs the inheritance is complete and now he has the skill of a level 70. No Name and all his stats is heading to the designated waypoint and his dungeon affinity has dropped to 92.49%. Examining his surroundings, he notes that while he is alive, he hasn't returned to Rubia, wondering if he will ever see her again. A memorial window informs him he has died five times and earned a bonus, upgrading him to Necromancer's Lover. 
which gives him plus 20 like ability with necromancers with whom he has close ties, and an additional 10 with the necromancer with whom he has a working relationship. As he wonders if Rena had been acknowledged as a necromancer, he remembers her taking arrows for him and decides he should repay her. But before that, they should escape the dungeon. No Name wakes Rena up and tells her that they must leave now. Knowing that he must exit the dungeon before his affinity increases to the point where he hallucinates and subjugation forces arrive, he decides to go to the next dungeon, planning to head to the arid underground cemetery. But Rena points out that they should head for the ruins of Spider's Vault instead, since the cemetery is completely barren, as if all the monsters there suddenly vaporized. Remembering the subjugation forces, he asks Rena about the Blue Lion Templars. She informs him that they are the first or second ranked knightage in the service of the Empire. They are led by the Marquis, Vatien von Leandro, who wields the blade Seraphim and is one of the top four swordsmen unmatched in the whole Empire. No Name immediately recognizes him as the warrior who killed him, and wonders what brought him to that remote corner of the realm without his knights. Rena then states they must head to a nearby town to gather supplies before heading to the next dungeon, and because she wants to bathe as well. No Name, realizing he hadn't considered her needs, agrees. At dawn, they approach the biggest town in the region, which happens to be Ublam. Remembering Rubia's fate, No Name decides to accompany Rena into town, and she puts a cloak on him before they head for the gate. They manage to get into the town by bribing the guard and pretending to be a married couple, much to No Name's surprise. And as they enter, Rena notices a strong scent of opium despite there being no den nearby. They both realize that the mood is strange, and the townspeople are wary of them. And as Rena playfully leads him in search of lodgings, a dark figure watches them from an alley. No Name and Rena are welcomed into the inn by a beautiful barmaid. As Rena asks for food and lodging, No Name notices she lacks the neck tattoo of the previous owner. The new innkeeper mistakes his stare for something else, much to Rena's annoyance and No Name's confusion. The next day, with Rena well rested, the pair head for the general store, while No Name notes that no one tried to sneak on them, sensing they are being shadowed. The shopkeeper refuses to sell firebombs, antidotes, or Molotov cocktail materials to Rena, being out of stock and unwilling to trade with them much to the girl's annoyance. No Name, still wary of being followed, drags a furious Rena out of the store, and the pair manage to sneak on the man shadowing them, recognizing him as the town's blacksmith. The man bids them to follow him, stating that it is dangerous to keep wasting time in the town. At the smithy, the three start talking. The blacksmith deduces that the pair was headed to the ruins of Spider's Vault from the supplies Rena needed, and explains that she wouldn't find them in town, since the Lord of Ublam and his guards are raising spiders for unknown reasons and the town is dying. As he recounts, after the previous lord died under mysterious circumstances, the new lord replaced the guards with brutes, and the town became addicted to opium, selling their property cheaply to the lord in order to buy more drugs. Those who disobeyed or questioned the lord, including the blacksmith's wife, were fed to the spiders. He then tells No Name to get revenge in his place, recognizing the armor he is wearing as one of his works, having been purchased by Rubia for someone dear to her. He proceeds to tell an enraged No Name that lonely tourists become targets, and that he did nothing because he was a coward and, being old, couldn't save Rubia himself. Informing No Name that the captain of the guards should be taking the criminals to the cavern now, he gives them a vial of Grasmere's flame, a flame from the sea that never goes out, so he can burn down the guards and spiders. Chained prisoners are led to the ruins of Spider's Vault while being trailed by Rena and No Name. As they approach the dungeon's entrance, Rena asks who should carry a flamethrower-like weapon. In a flashback, it is revealed that the blacksmith is from Grasmere, the town of blacksmiths, and Grasmere's flame is very rare, with him only being able to make a single vial. This must be used with that weapon, and once started, the fire will never go out, being kept in the bottle only through magic, and having the same power as a blast furnace. The smith gave them the weapon as well as flame-resistant powder, stating that he'd rather have them use it to get rid of the guards than to use it himself for his craft. With Rena holding the flamethrower, they head inside the caverns, with No Name noticing how quiet and maze-like the dungeon is. Rena interrupts his thoughts to ask him about Rubia and what she meant to him, with No Name cutting her short, stating that she meant nothing and the armor was needed for their mutual benefit but he failed to keep his promise to protect her. As No Name wonders which path to take, a nervous Rena hands him a pendant, stating that it is a precious item to her and she is lending it to him. Before he can refuse, No Name notices something sticky dripping onto his helmet and turns to face an incoming giant spider. Rena sounds the alarm before being caught by a web and hoisted upwards while the spider strikes at No Name. He unsheaths his blade and cuts off the creature's leg, but is ambushed from behind by a second spider that pins him to the ground as he tries to hold it at bay. As Rena cries for help, No Name manages to regain his sword and dispatch the spider. 
and stands up to face an incoming wall of creatures. Rena recognizes the gravity of the situation as she dangles upside down and the spiders approach her. Meanwhile, No Name keeps hacking at the spiders in the ground, parrying and dodging their attacks as they keep coming, until several spiders shoot their web at him, rendering him immobile. A spider approaches and is about to finish him off before suddenly bursting into flames. A surprised No Name turns to see a deranged Rena holding the flamethrower, and apologizing for her tardiness before proceeding to torch the spiders. She torches a spider that attempts to ambush her and compliments her weapon, noticing that the spiders are retreating further inside the dungeon. After she frees No Name, the two follow the spiders, torching any that dare cross their path. And as a blue window pops up, No Name notes that combat experience yields a faster rate of leveling. Rena teases No Name before collapsing, with the latter realizing upon inspection that she's been bit and needs an antidote. At the heart of the dungeon, a group of soldiers try to drive the Spider Queen boss back with their torches, and No Name assumes that they must have antidotes, wondering why would they attempt to raise monsters. The captain of the guards, sporting a snake tattoo on his neck, warns the queen to behave, else they burn her eggs to a crisp. Recalling Rubia, No Name clenches his fist in anger as he sees the captain of the guards. A newbie soldier asks another why they bring the criminals there before being told to shut up. He is then held at sword point by No Name, who presents a startled captain with the choice to hand over the antidote in exchange for a painless death and sparing his men. The captain laughs at this and wonders if No Name is a druggie for doing this, prompting the latter to explain that he is here to avenge Rubia. Unmoved, the captain smirks and remarks that he doesn't even remember her among his countless victims, causing No Name to release his hostage and lunge at him before being hit by a bottle of spider egg yolk. This causes the Spider Queen to impale No Name through the chest, seeing him as an intruder who stole her egg. The captain then comments that it is believed the Queen was a chimera, created and abandoned by mages, and that she protects her eggs with a maternal bond. Snickering, the captain turns to depart, just before the Queen erupts in flames. As he turns back, he is confronted by a helmetless No Name, wielding the flamethrower and pouring heat-resistant powder on his head before unleashing the flames on his men while promising him an agonizing death. Spiders are torched by No Name as they approach him, while the soldiers, eggs, and everything flammable burns. As No Name approaches him, a burning captain begs in vain for his life, before being burnt to a crisp. No Name continues to burn everything in rage, unaware of Rena and the fact that he is starting to melt until he collapses and dies, his assimilation rate dropping to 90.14% as darkness descends. No Name resurrects in the dungeon next to Rena, as the blue window confirms that the inheritance is complete and analyzes how he died. As Rena wakes up, he tells her they are headed to Ublam, knowing what will happen. No Name repeats the same events as before in the town, with Rena arguing with the shopkeeper, them confronting and following the surprised blacksmith to his forge, and receiving the vial of Grasmere's flame, the flamethrower, and heat-resistant powder. No Name then throws the bag of powder at the blacksmith's face and threatens to test it on him by torching him with the flamethrower, much to the latter's horror. He then points out that the powder only prevents him from feeling the heat, but if he used it, his armor would melt before he noticed, and asks the blacksmith why he would want them dead as well. The blacksmith then says that he knows he is not human due to how he moves in the armor, and thus he would prefer that he die after burning the guards. This enrages Rena, but No Name sees no point in killing the blacksmith and starts to leave stating that he would have killed the guards anyway, before he stops to notice a new, sturdy, two-handed sword. Though the blacksmith protests at his taking it, No Name states that it is the price for attempting to kill them, and leaves. Now armed with the sword and the flamethrower, No Name and Rena reach the ruins of Spider's Vault. The girl points out that they should use the flamethrower carefully, and merrily starts to enter the dungeon, before No Name, remembering how she died because of him and unwilling to put her in danger, knocks her unconscious and enters the dungeon alone, promising to return soon. No Name burns his way into the dungeon, handling the power of Grasmere's flame with care, before being confronted by a perplexed captain and his guards. Upon one of his men's suggestion, the captain tries to fool No Name, claiming that they will escort him to safety, while preparing to throw him a vial of egg yolk a second time. He fails, however, and No Name shatters the vial with his sword, as a surprised captain asks him who he is. The skeleton then states that he promised him an agonizing death upon which he orders his men to attack. No Name then burns them all as the captain escapes, noting he cannot use the flame for long else he melts again. The captain then strikes him from behind, breaking the flamethrower, pointing out that the Spider Queen is furious at No Name for breaking her eggs before picking the last one. Using it as a hostage, he orders the queen to attack, and though No Name blocks the attack, he is flung across the cavern. 
He wonders what to do as he blocks the incoming attacks, finally stumbling on a rock and falling to the ground. He then notices the broken flamethrower and darts towards it as the queen strikes and shatters his helmet. The captain rejoices at this before noticing that the queen's leg is now on fire, and turning to face No Name brandishing his now flaming sword and repeating his promise of the agonizing death. The Spider Queen roars as No Name slices her limbs before finally striking her down in one fell swoop with his flaming sword. As the skeleton stands over the spider's corpse, the captain, shocked by this outcome, tries to strike him down from behind. No Name chops his sword hand off, the blade cauterizing the wound, and once again promises a slow, agonizing death. Frantic, the captain orders his men and the spiders to deal with him before realizing they're all dead. Fleeing, his shirt catches fire from touching a puddle of Grasmere's flame. Distracted by his futile attempts to stop the fire from spreading and fleeing No Name, the captain stumbles backwards and falls off a ledge to his death. No Name comments on this stupid way to die, and thinking it's all over and considering the sword too dangerous to carry, throws it over the ledge as well. As he turns around, however, he is confronted by a badly wounded but still standing Spider Queen. Now disarmed and with his back against the cliff, the skeleton stands still as the queen carefully picks up and embraces her last remaining egg just before dying and dropping a red jewel. A blue window pops up informing that No Name has defeated the Web Slinger. As a reward for completing the dungeon, he has boosted his soldier points considerably, as well as initiated the borderline adventure quest and earned a speed boosting skill and a ruby. No Name emerges from the cave with a bag of loot and is confronted by an angry Rena. She angrily yells at him for knocking her out and going in alone, but her face changes drastically when he presents her the bag full of gold and she promises to become stronger to avoid becoming a hindrance and telling him not to leave her behind again. She then leads him to her guild's branch office. Sometime later, they arrive at an orphanage and Rena is greeted by the children, including her sister, and introduces No Name as the knight who helped her out. The headmaster of the orphanage then greets her and they head inside. The young, well-dressed man and Rena get reacquainted and the latter introduces No Name. The headmaster then introduces himself as Lime and after noticing how taciturn he is, suggests that No Name take his armor off. The skeleton refuses and is then shocked as Lime reassures him that he is fine with what's underneath the armor. But the conversation is cut short when a child's screams are heard outside, and Lime states that there are unwelcome guests in the premises, offering to continue later. In the courtyard, two armed men and a woman are trying to take a child by force, accusing her of running away. Lime intercedes and offers to talk things out once they release her. The men explain that they run the orphanage at the nearby village, and the child ran away after being sent to a court who backs the establishment and took a liking to her in order to be his adopted daughter. Lime then points out that she ran away due to mistreatment, but before the men can react, the woman halts them. She tells Lime that if he acts like they didn't see them, then they could just be on their way, but the headmaster refuses. The woman then offers an agreement to profit from the children, demanding he give them the children they want. She is cut short by Lime, who states he doesn't run the orphanage so pigs like them can use children as puppets, upon which the woman orders the men to attack. Though No Name is concerned, Rena assures him that everything is alright, and that the men are the ones in need of assistance. The woman grins as the men cut Lime down, but is shocked to see that he is made of slime and has engulfed her henchmen. Lamenting how humans become ugly and stupid when they age, Lime consumes the terrified woman next, while a shocked No Name and a smug Rena look from afar. Lime then apologizes and introduces himself properly as Slime, the manager of the TNT Guild's Eastern Branch Office. Standing amidst the clothes and weapons of the dead intruders, Slime introduces himself to No Name as a type of changeling, a fellow non-human trying to live in the human world. No Name is surprised at seeing one of the rare intelligent slimes before him, and asks him how he will deal with the consequences of what he did. While he comforts the child the intruders wanted to grab, he states that cleaning up that mess poses no problem, much to the skeleton's uneasiness and Rena's satisfaction. Back inside, Slime explains that he runs an orphanage because slimes have no gender nor parent-child relationships, and he finds it interesting that humans look vastly different when they grow up. He states that though slimes can adopt any form, they are merely shells since they are shapeless creatures, and offers to take the form of a skeleton which No Name politely declines. After the latter asks how he knew he was a skeleton, Slime is revealed to be an excellent appraiser due to being a slime, giving him great leeway within the guild. In appreciation for helping Rena, he offers to appraise anything No Name desires, and the latter gives him the ruby. As Slime appraises the jewel, No Name reasons that Rena was not distrusting of him due to having grown up with Slime in the orphanage, 
Once the appraisal is complete, a blue window pops up stating the use of the ruby as an ingredient for a class change and its perks. And Slime points out that it is quite valuable and suitable after absorbing blood and vital force of humans for a long time. Suddenly, another blue window pops up informing No Name that his assimilation rate has dropped to 88.68%, causing him to shake noticeably and causing Slime to worry. No Name brushes it off and praises the Slime's skill and prompted by the latter asks if there's a spare sword he can take. Instead, in gratitude for keeping Rena safe, Slime offers to get one from the blacksmith and repair No Name's armor, while also providing him a room to rest for the night, which he accepts gratefully. That night, No Name stares at the ruby thinking about a class change when Rena enters his room and asks if he's stargazing. No Name asks if she shouldn't be spending more time with her sister and sleeping together, to which she replies that she doesn't wish to make her want to stay longer and that one day would come when they could live together. She then approaches No Name and gives him her precious golden pendant, explaining that it was around her neck when she was abandoned at the orphanage. Sweetly, she says that she's giving it to him for the day when he completes his quest and she becomes branch manager, asking him to live with her. They stare at each other in silence. The next day, No Name examines his repaired armor with Slime and admires his new sword, before Rena enters the room and averts her gaze. Later, Slime asks the skeleton about their next destination, and upon the latter's uncertainty, he proposes that No Name join the TNT Guild. As he explains, Rena's rank of trainee limits the quality and quantity of information she can acquire in the guild. But if No Name were to join, he would receive all the benefits granted to official members under Slime's recommendation. Though Slime believes he would be a great member, No Name declines the offer since being tied down to a group is not his style, much to Slime's disappointment. No Name then states that he will continue to get any information he needs from Rena going forward, causing her to blush. He then asks Slime what would be needed for Rena to become an official member, and once the latter explains she can either take requests by the guild or donate gold, he proceeds to offer him the bag of gold obtained from the spider's vault. As Slime states that it will be enough, a blue status window pops up updating his progress in the scenario Rena's story, and informing No Name that his assimilation rate has decreased to 88.56%. The skeleton wonders what this means while Slime reads the guild bylaws to Rena. But No Name stops them as the branch manager mentions the obligation to inform on any grave threat to the peace of Amber. Amber is a maritime port as well as the city of engineers, and No Name recalls that soon the city will be the starting point of the Nine Years' War, which will be initiated by the Crown Prince Alton Clements II between the Empire and the Freedom Alliance. While neutral, the city's anarcho-syndicalist nature will end up annoying the Crown and its efforts to expand the Empire. Being situated between it and the Freedom Alliance, it will become the Empire's first target. No Name then asks Slime why Amber is mentioned in the procedure for promotion, and as the latter informs him that it is the location of the guild's headquarters, the skeleton wonders if he should tell him what he knows. He chose to skirt around the subject, asking if Amber's position as the biggest obstacle for the Empire in a supposed war with the Freedom Alliance would count as a grave threat. Although Slime agrees, he states that a proper response has been prepared should the Empire take any action and refuses to elaborate any further. As Slime congratulates Rena for her promotion, No Name asks as to the requirements for her to become branch manager, much to Slime's amusement, and he insists on prioritizing Rena's promotion since it would be useful to him. Slime ponders on this and informs him of difficult requests that must be dealt with, and though Rena could not take them on by herself, they would speed up her next promotion if she were to succeed. As Rena looks with unease and asks Slime if he will accept the quest, a blue option window pops up asking him either to accept or decline. A host stands amidst a packed arena and energetically announces to the Aorist tournament to the roaring crowds. He then introduces the first contestant, the Dismantler, Jacob Isaac from the Brass Ring Free Company. As he introduces his opponent, first-time participant Serai Jagan from a household in Janae, no name steps into the arena. The host then bids the contestants to get ready and begin the fight. The Dismantler lunges forward and jumps into the air, aiming to deliver a mighty blow to No Name's head with his great hammer. Some days before this, Slime explains to No Name that a household from Janae has requested the guild for a mercenary to enter the tournament while bearing their crest in their stead. Having earned their title by accumulating wealth through their leather business and commerce, they were too preoccupied with their trade to train a knight and instead wished to hire a mercenary to avoid the pressure to participate in the tournament from the event's sponsor. This sponsor is the Lord of Arist from the Ray family and younger brother of the deceased Lord. 
No Name will be paid every time he wins until the 8th round, since they don't want to attract any attention and they're hiring a mercenary. No Name accepts the request, and as he and Rena hitch a ride in the back of a wagon, the skeleton concludes that the Lord of Arist must be Rubia's uncle, responsible for her brother and niece's deaths, and wonders if he should kill him. Without looking at him, Rena once again asks No Name about his relation to Rubia and what kind of person she was. To which he replies that there was nothing between them and he wouldn't even know how to begin to answer that last question, stating that she was probably attractive. Rena then asks if No Name would have given Rubia a different answer to the question she posed in the orphanage. The skeleton bluntly answers that he would have answered the same, since there is something he must do, being acknowledged by a disappointed Rena. The conversation is cut short as they're approaching Arist. A crowd forms a line to pass the city gates, while the pair approaches a stand to enlist No Name in the tournament as a knight for the House of Janae. When the enlister asked for a name, No Name pauses in thought, and as Rena attempts to cover for him in front of the suspicious man, the skeleton presents himself as Saray Jagan. While No Name tells Rena that Saray Jagan is a made-up name, he inwardly recalls that he took it from the disruptor Saray and the savage ox Jagan, two of the sixteen demon lords that will descend upon mankind after the Nine Years' War, and that there shouldn't be any problem with uh, borrowing the names. No Name never saw any of the demon lords while in the demon army, being a low-ranking skeleton living a nightmare while controlled by the necromancer until he met Mistress Succubus. Rena pulls him from his thoughts, asking him his real name stating that before she didn't consider it important since she thought there were no more walking skeletons like him. No Name then states that he doesn't even know what his name is, and Rena offers to come up with a name for him. As she suggests names to the annoyed skeleton, a man announces that the tournament will commence the next day, and they will be fed and lodged in the castle, being able to freely move around the castle grounds between matches. Knowing this was Rubia's home, No Name asks the surprised man for directions to the castle library. Once in the library, the librarian praises No Name's desire to learn as well as fight. The skeleton asks if she has any books by Kevin Ashton, but the librarian doesn't recognize the author and begins to look around. No Name notes the messy state of the place when a book lands by his feet. Looking up, he sees an apparition of Rubia reading atop some stairs, which is cut short when the librarian brings him to the novel Crevice of Time by Kevin Ashton. The librarian then picks up the fallen book, lamenting that the person who read it is no longer there, causing No Name to inquire about it. Visibly scared at having said too much, the woman excuses herself and quickly departs, leaving No Name alone. He then opens Crevice of Time and reads it quickly until Rena finds him, having been assigned a room. A blue window informs him that he has increased his wisdom by 10 and can now sense other skeletons, having also earned a bonus of insight. Rena then states that they should go, and once he looks at her, another window pops up stating her name, profession, level, stats, and a likability of 40. No Name swings his sword until a blue window pops up with his stats, noticing that his swordsmanship doesn't get higher than level 5, and wonders about his insight bonus as Rena approaches him, informing him that the tournament will begin soon. Fireworks light up the sky as the Aorist tournament begins. The host asks for a round of applause as Lord Ray enters the arena while Rena and No Name look from afar. As the first round of the preliminaries begin, the pair discusses about whether the tournament's prize is worth the effort of the competitors, and Rena points out that the real prize is the prestige the nobles gain from their knight's success. Knights also benefit since it is their best opportunity to increase renown and raise their worth other than war. This is especially so for oathless knights, who hope to get noticed by the noble houses and taken into their employ. No Name is told to get ready for the next match, and though Rena encourages him, the skeleton plans to avoid getting too much attention. In the arena, the host explains that the round will last until either contestant is incapacitated or steps out of the battle stage. While No Name thinks about the difficulty of throwing his opponent off the stage, Jacob Isaac berates him for his apparent weakness. Wishing to know his true strength, the skeleton uses his insight skill to see his stats. As the fight begins, No Name uses his superior agility to dodge his opponent's attack and break his hammer, much to the latter's shock and disbelief. No Name offers the now disarmed Jaycott to surrender, but the warrior lunges at him enraged and attempts to punch him. With no other choice, the skeleton dodges the punch and swiftly knocks his opponent unconscious with the pommel of his sword, causing everyone present to fall silent in shock. Prompted by No Name, the judge proclaims him victor and the crowd bursts into applause much to the surprise of No Name and to the delight of Rena, An insight window shows the stats of level 17 fighter Colin Herrett as he thrusts at No Name with a spear. He dodges the attack and knocks his opponent down. Later, the window displays the stats of a level 29 warrior Jang Philip, 
who attempts to strike No Name with his chains only for him to catch them with his sword and pull the warrior towards him and incapacitate him, causing the crowd to cheer again. Later, the skeleton praises the convenience of the insight skill for allowing him to gauge his opponent's strength and act accordingly, and wonders who Kevin Ashton might be. He snaps out of his thoughts as he notices Rena holding off three men who wish to see him. They introduce themselves as representatives of a merchant group, a fiefdom, and a noble family, and ask that No Name work for them as their guard, each competing to offer him a better payment. He refuses their offers regardless of his salary, and after some thought, states that he will not abandon the house of Janae, much to Rena's surprise. As the men ask No Name to reconsider, a drunken swordsman yells at them to quiet down so he can sleep, and stating he is a participant of the tourney. He asks the guards to take care of them and escort them away. Rena then tells a shocked No Name that the drunk is his next opponent, causing No Name to wonder inwardly on how a drunkard got into the quarterfinals, activating Insight to check his stats. He is shocked as the Insight window is completely blank, and is even more puzzled when he tries again and gets the same result. In the arena, the host introduces No Name as Sir Jagan, and his opponent as Tebold Reynolds, noting his incredible speed. Tebold asks the host for the restroom but is denied since the fight is about to begin, while No Name wonders why Insight doesn't work on this man. As the fight begins, the skeleton decides to forego Insight and lunges at Tebold, prepared to strike. Needing to pee, Tebold laments the situation before swiftly dodging the attack and appearing behind No Name, promising to end the fight quickly and mentioning Imperial Fencing First Chapter, before attacking the confused skeleton. No Name barely manages to block the attack and is complimented by Tebold. As the swordsman unleashes another attack, the skeleton then grimly realizes why Insight doesn't work on him. Tebold has a far higher level than himself. The pair continue to duel as No Name blocks the incoming attacks, much to Tebold's delight. The swordsman then parries the skeleton's sword and lunges at the gap in his armor, noting his lack of combat experience, but is surprised as No Name closes the gap in time and somersaults to a safer position. Tebold notes that it didn't feel as if his strike had succeeded. No Name thinks on how he was saved due to the blade passing through his ribs, which would have been fatal for a human. Wondering who Tebold might be, he asks him about the Imperial fencing, to which the swordsman replies that he used to be an Imperial knight. He then proceeds to taunt No Name, stating that he isn't skilled enough to become an Imperial knight himself, and then presses his attack, challenging No Name to strike. While blocking his attacks, No Name thinks Tebold must be weaker than Vatien, and since he might have to face strong Imperial soldiers in the future, he can't lose to a retired knight. As the swordsman presses yet another attack, the skeleton sees an opening. Tebold's technique is based on lunging, which at one point exposes him to side attacks. Seizing the opportunity, No Name hacks at Tebold from the side and manages to cut him in the arm before he dodges the strike, causing the crowd to gasp in awe. Wounded but alive, the swordsman stands to attention and decides to face his opponent as a proper Imperial Knight. As Rena wonders who Tebold might be, an Oathless Knight informs her that he is an Imperial Knight due to his sword technique, and is surprised that No Name hadn't lost yet. Apologizing for fighting him drunk, Tebold states that there is a special requirement to becoming an Imperial Knight other than battle instincts, but he will only reveal it to No Name if he manages to defeat him. He then blocks the skeleton's attack, commenting he is better at blocking, before driving his sword to the ground. The swordsman then launches an attack with a curved path that surprises No Name, and sends him flying backwards, then promising to end the fight with a swift strike. No Name raises his sword, but the curved attack pierces his neck and sends him falling to the ground. As Tebolt approaches the host to claim victory, he is startled to see a panting No Name rising and resuming the fight, causing him to wonder if he's a monster. The skeleton then states that he doesn't plan to become an Imperial Knight, but he is after Marquis Vatien, and can't be defeated by an Imperial Sword Art that easily before he faces him again. Tebolt is furious at hearing that name and asks No Name if he thinks Vatien is so amazing before he attacks in rage. As he delivers blow after blow on No Name's armor, he states if Vatien didn't exist, he wouldn't have failed to become an Imperial Knight, and his father wouldn't have become so disappointed in him. Tebolt then unleashes a second form attack, which cracks No Name's breastplate, asking him what is so important about a title, while No Name thinks that at this rate, he will lose the fight. Suddenly, Tebolt drops his sword and forfeits the match, with No Name being proclaimed victor. Tebolt gloomily tells the skeleton that the special requirement is blade skills, and the lack thereof is what prevented him from becoming a knight before departing the arena without his sword. That night, the semi-finalists are given a banquet, though neither No Name nor the Oathless Knight remove their helmets or touch the food, 
The skeleton checks the stats of the three remaining contenders, noticing that Tebolt was the strongest in the whole tournament, and that without blade skills his armor is useless. Lord Ray sits at the head of the table surrounded by four bodyguards and congratulates the participants, telling them to enjoy the evening. Noticing the snake tattoos on the guards' necks, No Name recognizes them as Necron Society members, and the insight window reveals that they are of the same level or stronger than Tebolt. Lord Ray praises No Name for his skill, offering him the opportunity to serve under him and be able to display his true worth, much to the surprise of the other semi-finalists. He states that he believes that seats are filled by those deserving them, and talentless people taking up space frustrates him. Despite wanting to kill the Lord right there for what he did to Rubia and her father, he refrains from doing so, knowing that the guards would kill him. Annoyed by his silence, Lord Ray gives No Name time to consider his offer, stating that he might regret not answering now since he has no interest in losers. He then asks No Name if he wouldn't take off his helmet, and despite being displeased at the refusal, decides to overlook it given his skill nodding to the Oathless Knight and referring to him as Creston the Hellraiser. No Name recognizes him as his next opponent and wonders about his name. Lord Ray then expresses his excitement about their upcoming fight, stating that he will see their faces regardless of who wins. He then snaps his fingers and beckons six scantily clad women to enter the room and entertain his guests. Though the other two semi-finalists enjoy themselves, Creston rises violently and leaves the room and No Name follows suit. Outside, the Oathless Knight confronts the skeleton wondering why he left and stating that he never heard of an Imperial Knightage in Janae. He doesn't believe that the House of Janae hired knights in these peaceful times and thinks that No Name bribed his way in. As the skeleton points out that he knows quite a lot about knights, the Hellraiser asks if he is trying to be appointed as a knight in Arist after inflating his worth. Annoyed, No Name asks Creston why he always wears a helmet, causing him to draw his sword and asking what he knows about him. To which No Name replies he knows nothing. Sheathing his sword, the Hellraiser promises to crush No Name's insolent attitude and helmet the next day. Rena approaches a man making bets on the upcoming semi-finals, betting a bag of gold on No Name. She's surprised to find the skeleton behind her and, despite the latter's initial reluctance, she encourages him to win the fight. As the announcer presents Saray Jagan and Creston the Hellraiser to the crowd, No Name analyzes his strategy, facing his opponent's sword, while Creston warns him that if he holds back in the fight, he will die. As the fight begins, Creston darts to deliver a decisive blow with his greatsword. No Name dodges the strike and lands a blow on the Hellraiser's armor, planning to use his superior agility to win, before having to dodge a second strike. Preston states his resilience and proceeds to strike the arena causing a cloud of dust to rise. Using this distraction, he sneaks behind No Name and delivers a blow with all of his might, which the skeleton barely manages to deflect. Commending his opponent's ability to dodge, the Oathless Knight states that his fall will be a matter of time. Knowing dodging won't work, No Name then decides to try something reckless and lunges towards Creston. He delivers two blows at close quarters in quick succession which shatter the knight's armor and sends his helmet flying. The crowd and the skeleton stare in shock as the knight is revealed to be a woman. The crowd stands in shock and Lord Ray beckons his men as No Name and Creston face each other in the arena. Enraged, the female warrior yells at the skeleton, but one of Lord Ray's bodyguards demands that she gives her real name to be recognized as a proper contestant. Once she states her name as Christina Brewer, the soldier, pointing out that women can't compete in the tournament, dismisses her. The woman then demands a chance to fight, and despite the soldier denying it, Lord Ray allows it as long as her opponent has no objections. With No Name's consent, the fight resumes. Lord Ray muses to himself on how amusing the fight will be if accompanied by a woman's screams, and the crowd roars in outrage at Christina's deception, and also the money they'll lose for betting on her. Exhausted, she tells No Name to stop holding back and asks if it's due to her being a woman. Recalling past trauma, she desperately lunges at her opponent before tripping on the arena and falling to the ground, causing the crowd to roar in anger and throw rocks at her, much to Rena's disgust. While on the ground, Christina recalls the merciless training her father gave her, wherein he threatened her to end their relation if she fails to make the family better, and he raged at the fact that she was a woman, much to her suffering. Noting the crowd's mockery, No Name suggests that she hold back to avoid getting badly injured, but before he can finish the sentence, he is sent flying by a devastating strike, much to everyone's surprise. Christina is exhaling steam, her eyes glow red as she stands on guard. A blue window pops up informing No Name that she has activated the Berserk skill, turning into a Berserker with far higher stats. Christina screams in rage as she delivers another powerful blow that shatters the arena. 
which Noné manages to evade while wondering the reason for all this transformation. Seeing her berserker mode and the odds turning in her favor, the crowd's mood changes as they begin to cheer for Christina. As No Name thinks about her new strength and speed, the warrior darts at him and sends him flying across the arena. Much to the crowd's rejoice, Lord Ray's interest, and Rena's concern. Contemplating how the situation has changed despite her being a lower level than himself, No Name decides to act quickly. He uses his superior speed ability to knock her back and begins circling around her. The Berserker counters this move by furiously swinging her sword in a wide circle, but it's in vain as the skeleton managed to jump clear and deliver a blow that slashes her back. This is not enough, however, as Christina roars and remains standing. And while he wonders about what kind of monster she has become, a blue window informs him that his speed ability has run out and must be recharged. He then notices that the Berserk ability drains her energy over time, and seeing this as an opportunity, he prepares to strike. He stops dead in his tracks as he sees Christina in tears as she asks for a chance to continue fighting, which reminds him of his first death. With Rena urging him to finish the fight, the skeleton then approaches the Berserker, blade in hand. A flash is heard as everyone stares in shock. Christina stands visibly surprised as the host announces her victory over her opponent, who is laying on the arena. Rena approaches the fallen no-name in distress and tries to wake him up, tearing up at the thought of losing him. She is startled as the skeleton rises, completely fine but with aching joints, and flustered ushers him away while Christina stares from the arena. In the forest, No Name suggests that he lost on purpose, while Rena laments the money she lost betting on him, before suddenly changing her mood and remarking that they completed their mission. Christina then approaches, asking for another fight, thinking he let her win, knowing that she didn't have the energy to overcome him. The skeleton, however, insists that he was just reckless and lost due to being hit by her sword, and he urges her to go and win the tournament. When asked whether they will meet again, No Name replies that he doesn't know, before warning her to avoid Aerist if she wants to become a knight. Ironically, he also advises her not to wear a helmet, before departing with Rena. Back at the TNT orphanage, Slime gives the pair their commission for completing the request, pointing out that the situation is uncomfortable since his performance at the tournament has caused many to seek to become knights for the Janae family. The branch manager then asks the skeleton about the name Saray Jagan and takes notes when he states he thought it up on the spot. No Name then asks for the next request, being worried due to the events that transpired in Arist, and a blue window pops up asking him to confirm his choice. No Name and Rena focused on dungeons for the next three months, avoiding the North Alpine region but traversing the mountains south of the Empire. Their adventures included traversing the withering burn maze of poisonous branches, fighting the centaurs in the bloodstained equestrian quota, and running away from ghouls in the Den of the Dead earning more loot and upgrading No Name's armor with slime. As the skeleton muses about the last dungeon, Rena barges in asking him to accompany her, much to his confusion. Slime then explains that Rena needs a second letter of recommendation besides his own to become a branch manager, and that she will get it in the Eastern Division if she passes a simple test. But No Name may not accompany her since the location of the guild executives is a secret from outsiders. No Name tells her to go, stating he will clear a dungeon in the meantime. Rena leaves furious while the skeleton and branch manager talk about the goblin dungeon, with the latter informing that the dungeon might be connected to the Necron Society. The hooded man runs through a forest in the middle of the night. He dodges a salvo of crossbow bolts as his pursuers approach on horseback. Exhausted, he falls to his knees and rises again, sprinting away and begging someone to wait for him to come to the rescue. At the TNT regional branch, Slime informs No Name that those entering the goblin dungeon bear a neck tattoo, and that he has been finding Necron Society monsters who have taken over dungeons. The branch manager also informs the skeleton that the dungeon is also a mine containing bloodstones. These are rare stones used for magic, and some will be included in the compensation. He also remarks that the reward for this quest will be much higher than before, but the quest might be dangerous, and it requires the normalization of the dungeon. No Name accepts the quest. Sometime later, No Name stands in the middle of a forest looking at a map, realizing he is lost. His thoughts are cut short by nearby howls, and upon following them, he comes across a white pup ensnared in a bear trap. He examines the wounded animal and frees him before resuming his path, but before he can go any further, the dog stands on guard before him, barking furiously. Not understanding the reason for this behavior, No Name tries to shoo the pup away and passes by him. Suddenly, the ground gives way beneath him, and the skeleton falls down a pit. 
He manages to stop his fall by thrusting his sword into the cave wall just before he hit the metal spike lined bottom. Examining the pit, he sees an adult white wolf lying dead in the distance, impaled by the spikes. As the pup barks from above, the skeleton realizes that it must be his mother, and the pup was trying to warn him of the danger. Despite having escaped death, he realizes that he cannot escape alone from the pit. As the sun sets above, No Name remains in the pit with the white pup barking from above. Suddenly, voices are heard from above as some hunters attempt to catch the wolf pup. Analyzing his next move, the skeleton thinks about saving the wolf, but first decides to play dead. A bald man notices him and calls his comrades to leave the wolf and approach the pit. Thinking of the money they might earn selling No Name's gear, the bald man tells his associate that their hands are already dirty since he fell down the pit, and that he must go down and retrieve the armor. The latter has qualms about the situation and fears No Name might be alive and waiting to strike, so the bald man proceeds to set fire to the pit. No Name decides to continue playing dead and wait for the fire to consume itself, and as he wonders if he could survive it, a blue window pops up. It states that his flame resistance skill has activated, reducing heat damage while reducing his strength. Realizing he can endure this due to the skill acquired in the spider's vault, the skeleton lies still and waits for the fire to die out, upon which the associate descends a ladder and pokes at No Name, still fearing he might be alive. A blue window pops up indicating that the pseudo-death skill has been created. From above the pit, the bald man angrily urges his associate to hurry up and get the armor, and is musing on heading to the pub when two soldiers approach from behind. One of them reminds the terrified man that he had been warned of the consequences of hunting there again. At the bottom of the pit, the scared associate finally removes No Name's helmet, and as he opens his eyes, he is deeply shocked at the sight of his skull, screaming in a horror as the skeleton greets him and stands up. He is suddenly knocked to the ground as the bald man is tossed from above and lands atop him. No Name climbs the ladder as the soldiers are distracted, searching for valuable loot. He then notices a snake tattoo on one of the soldiers' necks, identifying them as members of the Necron Society. The soldiers are preparing to depart when No Name greets them, causing the startled men to turn around and confront him. As they begin to realize he came from the pit, the skeleton tells the shocked men to guide him to the goblin's dungeon. This causes them to draw their weapons and ask for his purpose in heading there. No Name answers that he was requested to do some things in the dungeon and reaches for his sword in preparation to fight the men. Suddenly, the lead soldier, noticing his cape, asks if the skeleton is Dero Nim, the new supervisor sent from the organization, and he sheaths his blade in relief, stating that he was expected. No Name decides to play along and says that yes, he is the supervisor, prompting the lead soldier to bow and tell his subordinates to do the same. The soldier states that he had been informed that the supervisor would be wearing a red cape and apologizes for not recognizing him. No Name accepts the apology and tells them to lead him to the dungeon. As they head to the dungeon, the lead soldier explains the profitability of the mine to No Name until his subordinate lets slip that the captain fools around with the goblins, much to his distress. Deciding that he might find out more by playing this role, the skeleton asks about any peculiarities about the work. The soldiers reply that there's a strange man the size of a kid snooping around who has managed to evade capture. He also remarks that the man seems to know things about the dungeon even they don't know, and knows its layout perfectly. The small man has managed in the past to free some slaves before they stopped him, and the soldiers suspect that there might be a spy. They finally reach the dungeon, and No Name looks down upon the massive mining operation underway. Enslaved goblins carry out hard labor under the watchful eye of whip-wielding overseers. One of the goblins collapses from exhaustion, dropping his load of minerals and causing the enraged overseer to whip him mercilessly. The overseer then orders some men to get rid of the badly beaten creature. No Name sees the enslaved goblins and recalls what his mistress told him about them. Goblins are a cowardly species that excels at reading lands and discovering materials, avoiding humans by hiding in the mountains. The most advanced goblins would become the main pillars for the 16 demon kings, and No Name heard that they despised humans with all their heart which seems unsurprising as he passes a pile of dead goblins. He is pulled from his thoughts by the soldiers as they enter the dungeon, and a blue window pops up describing it. It tells him that it is a large-scale dungeon with a base level of 10 to 20 that would require 15 to 20 people to clear. As No Name thinks on the information, the strange man trails the group from a distance. Deeper into the dungeon, the lead soldier introduces No Name as the new supervisor to his captain. The captain greets the skeleton and informs him of the progress of the mining operation. He also asks him to put in a good word for them to the higher-ups and offers their services for the duration of his stay. 
No Name complements their work, and inwardly analyzes the best course to fulfill the request to kill everyone in the dungeon, until the captain suggests that he take off his helmet. Fearing discovery and realizing he must make something up quickly, No Name excuses himself, stating that he can't remove the helmet due to a treatment for recent burns. And upon a request for identification, he states that he left it at home. The skeleton starts to believe that his luck is up, until the captain laughs it off. But then the captain requests to see the snake tattoo that would prove his allegiance to the Necron Society. The captain then realizes he is not the supervisor, and as No Name reaches for his blade, he signals his men to aim their crossbows at the intruder, promising to torture him for further information. No Name analyzes the situation, and heavily outnumbered and bereft of any other choice, activates his speed skill and lunges into combat. No Name cuts through the soldiers as the frantic captain orders them to fire their crossbows. The officer's joy at them hitting their target proves to be short-lived, as the skeleton continues to cut through his men at a high speed unhindered, and finally strikes him down. A blue window pops up informing No Name that he has earned the reward of Conqueror of the Thorny Maze, which decreases the damage done by crossbow bolts by 40%. As he heals, the skeleton stares at the three remaining soldiers who fall to their knees begging for their lives. After stating that he had no intention of killing them, he pries an ID from the dead captain's corpse and, having procured identification, tells the soldiers to guide him to where the goblins are. On the way, the soldiers explain to the skeleton that there is a second group of ten soldiers inside, and as he notices the dead goblins lying around, they point out that it is the work of the second group. Soon enough, they arrive to a tunnel where the second group of soldiers is shooting crossbow bolts at a restrained goblin for fun. No Name identifies the creature as a hobgoblin, a species far more intelligent and stronger than ordinary goblins. Hobgoblins also possess healing abilities and are referred to as royal goblins. The other goblins cry out at the ongoing torture, prompting the group leader to silence them, before noticing the approaching soldiers and No Name. When questioned as to their presence there at the time, No Name steps forward and introduces himself as the Supervisor. As the group leader attempts to remove his helmet, the skeleton grabs his forearm firmly and commands him not to touch him. Shocked, the group leader tells No Name to let him go, asking what's wrong with him, while the strange man continues to watch from a distance. Seeing the tied-up hobgoblin, the skeleton then twists the group leader's arm, and after some initial protests and upon seeing the three soldiers' signals, the officer pretends to apologize before pulling out a dagger and thrusting it through the armor's eye slit. As No Name falls to his knees, the group leader tells the soldiers to explain the situation. But before they get a chance to, they are struck with fear as the skeleton pulls the dagger out of his helmet. He proceeds to call the group leader despicable and stab him in the eye with the blade, causing the soldiers to fire their crossbows. Retrieving the dagger, the skeleton throws it at a soldier's face and slashes another with his sword, upon which the four remaining soldiers flee in terror. No Name then turns to the hobgoblin, wondering whether he's still alive while cutting through the ropes, before the strange man lassoes him and pulls him up his leg with a pulley. The small man then questions No Name as to his purpose there, and after some thought and argument, the skeleton admits to having been requested to return the dungeon to its normal state, not divulging who sent him, and then states that they are not enemies. Upon this statement, the strange man cuts him down and is revealed to be a small goblin. The goblin then heads towards his tied-up kin and tells the skeleton to go back since he will handle the problem. As the hobgoblin is untied, a blue window pops up informing No Name that his name is Insukasa's Bumtong, the dungeon boss. Outside the dungeon, two surviving soldiers run for their lives, thinking that their attacker must not be human, and wondering how to escape the fake supervisor. A man with a red cape and a snake tattoo approaches on a horse, and overhearing the conversation, asks the terrified men for the meaning of their words. Inside the dungeon, No Name stares at the released hobgoblin, and wonders how a dungeon boss was so weak to be captured like that. As he reaches for his blade, the dungeon boss runs away in fear, while the small goblin chases after him calling him daddy, and telling him to stay still while he heals him. The skeleton finds it strange that a hobgoblin was defeated by human soldiers, but the goblin child explains that they are peaceful, and the humans set traps to ensnare him and enslave his people. No Name insists and wonders aloud why the boss is ranked F-, much to the child's confusion, and later states that dungeons are measured in advance to determine their difficulty level and deter people from going. The child retorts that even though they only hide in the dungeon, that place is still their home, and then tells No Name to depart. As No Name is about to leave, he notices a bomb rolling towards him before being thrown away by the explosion. As the hobgoblin runs away in fear, the skeleton sees the supervisor approaching with the three soldiers. 
The man demands to know why No Name impersonated him, Darrow LaRouge Nim, and produces a small crossbow from under his cloak. Before he can fire, the goblin child dashes and slashes his wrist, causing the man to berate him as a slave. He then fires his crossbow, but the child manages to dodge the bolt, knocking the weapon from the supervisor's hand with his lasso, and jumping dagger in hand to deliver a killing blow. The goblin child falls back, a crossbow bolt piercing his chest. Upon seeing the scene, his father screams in horror and approaches his son while the supervisor mocks him and prepares to finish him off with his crossbow. Before he can fire, the enraged hob goblin knocks the weapon out of his hand with a quick swipe, and eyes glowing red proceeds to kill the supervisor, thrusting his fist through his chest and hoisting him up in the air before throwing him at the soldier's feet. The enraged and bloodied dungeon boss roars in fury, his muscles tearing up the bandages covering his wounds, while the soldiers flee and no name looks from the ground. A blue window pops up informing him that the hobgoblin's mad enchantment has activated, revealing the creature as a hidden dungeon boss and raising its stats until his strength or will to fight is consumed. It also warns that blood-red hobgoblins are extremely non-violent pacifists that will develop a strong desire to kill when angry, and it reveals a hidden quest to pacify the hobgoblin. The creature notices No Name and strikes, his blows being deflected by the skeleton's sword. He admires the hobgoblin's strength, but uses his superior skills to strike him from behind and send him flying across the room before choking him unconscious. Standing atop the dungeon boss, No Name wonders whether he should kill the creature, until he notices the worried goblins gathering, including the creature's son. The hobgoblin then stirs and begins talking, having regained his senses and embraces his son. A blue window informs No Name that the hidden quest had been completed, earning him 200 allegiance from the hobgoblin and a 70% rise in reputation with the Blood Red Goblin tribe, which will grow over time. It also informs that the assimilation ratio has decreased to 88.3%, causing the skeleton to ponder on its meaning, and noting that whenever something new is recognized, the assimilation rate goes down before trying to remember something. His thoughts are interrupted by the hobgoblin thanking him and offering to repay his kindness, which he refuses. The hobgoblin asks for his name, which the skeleton denies having. No Name then tells the goblins to hide deeper, warning of the impending human war and thinks on the Necron Society tattoo, and whether Rena could get more information if she were to become branch manager. He also takes an ID card and a purse of gold from the dead supervisor, and as he exits the dungeon, the hobgoblin runs after him and offers to repay him by telling him of the unique goblin mage. The hobgoblin tells No Name that the goblin mage, Mudcash, is a secret of the goblin race, and is captivated by gold coins and he has hoarded gold coins his whole life. Due to this greed, Mudcash plans on collecting every gold coin in the world, and for that purpose he created a magical coin purse that can hold an infinite number of coins, as well as presumably any other item. The skeleton's interest peaked. The hobgoblin proceeds to tell him that Mudcash is said to reside on the eastern mountains, but in order to find him he must go around shouting the secret code, tweak tweak tweak, so Mudcash will come to him. The goblin explains the code means, do you like money? I do, and proceeds to teach No Name how to make that sound. At the TNT orphanage, No Name informs Slime that he has completed the quest, and he even got rid of Necron society members. Slime thanks him and offers to repair his armor. The skeleton remarks that the snake tattoo worn by the members can strangle them to death, and the headmaster confirms it is the work of magic meant to kill anyone who attempts to leak secrets regarding the society. When No Name asks how to break the spell, Slime tells him that it depends on the power of the one who cast it, believing that he might know who that person is, but it's too early to say now. Slime then informs No Name that he might have to leave for the time being on guild business, and Rena has passed the test, and may have something to tell him when she returns. That night, an unarmored No Name is looking at the night sky from his window, when Rena surprises him from behind. She teases him and he notices her bruised face before asking about her promotion. Rena thanks him for his help and, after some pause, asks him to run away together, leaving everything behind save for her sister to live in hiding. The skeleton bluntly declines, reminding her of their agreement to use each other and make Rena branch manager so that she could be of use to him, causing her to sigh and state that the test isn't over yet. She then states that they told her that she must bring him to them at a specific time and location, and that after becoming branch manager would become abundant to her, suggesting they know about the skeleton's true nature. No Name notes the ominous request while a scared Rena states her unease and fear that he might regret going with her, 
stating that the guilt wasn't important and they should just run. No Name cuts her short and states that it's important to him since they need information, and Rena's promotion is a way to obtain it, while inwardly thinking that he also wants to clear the scenario. Rena comments on how No Name seems to be more interested than her in getting into the guild, before smiling warily and agreeing to go. At dawn, Rena and No Name ride a cart in silence heading for their destination. Come nightfall, they're close to arriving, and Rena leads the way to a ruined arena with an altar rising at its center and caverns at its sides. As they wait, the pair examines the structures, especially the altar, and as the clouds part, No Name is shocked as he identifies the symbols on the altar as the mark of the Demon King person. Remembering his days as a skeleton soldier, he recalls Demon King of Thunder commanding 26 units and donning a lion's head commanding his army with a trumpet while riding a gigantic black bear. No Name realizes that the TNT guild worships a demon king, and realizes the snake of the Necron Society is the symbol of the demon king Duke Bodus, who commanded 60 units. He concludes that, though it is still 10 years too early for the descent upon the world, the demon kings still influence this world. Suddenly, several robed figures appear from the rocky caverns in the arena, including an old man with a turban and a staff who presents himself as Patrick Ajar, a mage, and the third-ranking director of the TNT National Headquarters. He then introduces the other figures as other TNT executives who share the same beliefs, those beliefs being the reduction of the human population. No Name is shocked at this and asks the man the reason for summoning him there as well. Patrick states that they studied both his and Rena's past, noting that he immediately stood out from the rest, and proceeding to list his accomplishments since rising from his grave. Praising his strength, the mage states his desire to create a new world with him due to the merciless way humans treat other species. He removes his turban, revealing himself as a member of the deer people who are hunted by humans to use their horns in medicine. He also states that humans also kill each other, and remembering Rubia and Mistress Succubus, No Name asks the Deer Man about his plans. Patrick then states that there will be a great war, and the resulting blood must be offered to their king, so that he can descend upon the world to cleanse it of humans. No Name identifies their king as the Demon King, much to the applause of Patrick, and the crowd stands in awe as he states its name is Person. Seeing no need to explain the legends, the mage concludes, stating that preparations for the ritual to offer the blood and cries of humans to their king are complete, and once he descends, it will be the end of mankind. No Name is surprised that such a group exists, and remembering the war is about to start, he asks Patrick if they're responsible for manufacturing it. The mage simply states that the war was waged by the crown, and they only plan on increasing the casualties, preventing any call for truce, and manipulating the hero of the war, ultimately causing the Empire and Alliance to despise each other. Knowing the future, No Name thinks on how their plans will only partially succeed. Their god and his twelve brethren will descend upon the world after the offerings, and slaughter mankind for a decade until they're slain. He briefly thinks about how these followers would feel at seeing their gods die, and later asks Patrick where he thinks the Empire will strike first. He confirms that it is Amber, where the TNT headquarters are located, and that despite the city's powerful and brutal attempts to prevent the war, they failed. And after that, war preparations were hastened by the royal family. No Name asks the Deer Man if the TNT blocked the peace attempts causing him to laugh uncontrollably at the absurdity of the statement, since they never could have hoped to achieve that, and they simply failed. He states that there will be a war, and they're just going with the flow, and asks Rena and No Name to join them promising power. When the skeleton asks if he means power within the TNT, Patrick states that it's included, but he means actual power. He removes his staff and summons ancient powers as the hooded figures begin to transform into different monsters, much to Rena's shock. Patrick's antlers grow as he morphs into a gigantic deer, and many other followers assume their true forms as well, and begin to converge on No Name. No Name stares at Person's followers, and realizes that, despite being far below the chain of command, they still pose a threat to him. Patrick then stomps, unleashing lightning that splits the ground around him, and making No Name feel the enormous pressure under that fraction of Person's power. The Deer Man then offers this power to the skeleton, prompting the latter to inquire about its cost. Patrick states that once the seal is carved onto No Name's body, Person's power will flow through him if he believes. 
and he will only have to perform a ritual sacrifice every full moon. No Name notices the human followers present, and upon questioning, they reveal that they are regular humans who harbor hatred towards mankind, and are apologetic to the monsters for being born humans. The skeleton then recalls that after the descent of the Demon Kings, one in ten or twenty humans joined the monster army, including some that went with the flow as well as others who had already researched black magic and had no choice but to join, and a few who harbored real hatred towards humans, and truly believed that they should be wiped out. Patrick asks No Name if he will take the seal, promising to create a righteous world of balance. The skeleton states that he will not try to dissuade them, but will not join, since he will not devote himself to a king that will fail. A harpy calls this statement blasphemy, noting No Name's weakness and the power he's being offered. Inwardly, No Name agrees that he is nothing and might not survive fighting a harpy, and since his growth rate has reached its limit, a power boost would be welcome. However, he fears that they will demand that he devote his life after he takes the seal, and he doesn't know how many times he will revive if this will happen, unwilling to be person's slave no matter the power offered. As the harpy grows impatient, No Name asks Rena what she will do, and she asks him if he would want her to accept. No Name states that, though she might have power for 10 years, it would be gone after the Demon Kings are defeated. Sighing, Rena states that she would never take that power alone, and nothing else mattered as long as she and No Name were together. The Deer Man is surprised at the refusal, but No Name reaffirms to him that he does not object to their goals. He just doesn't want to become an underling to someone who will lose. The Harpy, furious once again at this blasphemy, bears her talons and ascends to strike him down. But before she can strike, Rena yells at everyone to stop. She states that if they don't let them go, she will fire the contents of her pack, revealing it to be full of Imperial Army Flares. Everyone stands still as Rena warns that the flares will cause people to come and look, and since the followers don't like the attention, they should let the pair go. As the Harpy complains, Patrick tells everyone to stand down. After confirming that No Name will not take the seal, Rena states that it will be difficult to stay alive now. A werewolf identifying himself as Brody Baldoff states that Rena is bluffing, and that he can handle any humans that come his way. A nervous Rena throws a quip concerning the werewolf's eyes before Patrick tells everyone to step away from Rena and No Name, since that is the optimal spot for Person's judgment and he doesn't intend to drag it any longer. Wondering if they're being released, No Name announces they will depart, before the Deer Man's antlers charge with magic and the creature paralyzes them where they stand. Patrick states he must kill them since they have heard too much, but first he offers them a final chance to join. No Name concludes that they can't forcefully carve the seal, which the Deer Man confirms. After some thought, the skeleton asks if the Necron Society is made of Botus's followers, and if the contract with Person will also kill them if they tell secrets. Patrick merely states that he will know the answer if he joins, or die if he doesn't, and after No Name requests the answer as a parting gift, he states that the Necron tattoos only empower the chief priest and enslaves the rest to do his bidding. As the Deer Man asks for them to choose once again, the flares in Rena's bag ignite, startling everyone present. A blindfolded woman whispers something in a Patrick's ear and he orders everyone to scatter. As everyone else hides, the blind woman remains with the paralyzed pair. Regretting that things turned out like that, she then states that before she leaves, she must take care of them. As she touches Rena's face, her hand turns into slime, revealing her to be the headmaster of the TNT orphanage as evidenced by her mismatched eyes. As the pair is being consumed, No Name reminds Slime that children will die if war breaks out, but the latter simply states that there is no other choice, and it is proper that humans should be exterminated. As the headmaster regrets that they couldn't work together any longer, No Name sees Rena begin to melt, before the darkness descends once more. No Name wakes up once again in the charnel house with Rena sleeping on his lap, thinking on the long life he had just had and the help he received from the TNT guild. He knows he can't go to them this time, or Rena will die again, and deeply regrets causing her death. A blue window confirms his inheritance is complete, and reveals that he has learned a new bonus of corrosive resistance after his seventh death, raising his resistance to acid. It also reveals the Necromancer's Lover bonus has been automatically selected. The skeleton concludes that in this life, he will have to be alone. 
Looking at Rina, he sees that her stats are different from last time and his assimilation rate has dropped to 87.75%. Rina then wakes up, stating she had a strange dream, much to no-name's surprise, and gives him her pendant, which he identifies as a token of trust, much to Rina's surprise. Despite accepting it, he states that they will be going on separate ways and he is leaving and that she shouldn't remain in the charnel house for more than a month. When Rina asks where they will meet again, the skeleton stands up and states that they won't. No Name apologizes to her and tells her to live her life freely as he departs the dungeon. Wondering where he should head next, he recalls the vacant arid underground cemetery dungeon and heads that way. Sometime later as he is nearing the dungeon, No Name is forced to hide as soldiers ride down the road, and before he decides what to do about them, the men stop in their tracks. They approach a katana-wielding swordsman down the road, and stating they are searching for spies, tells him to identify himself. The swordsman mocks them for patrolling the safest road, and as they ask him to state his rank, he snickers and tells them that he is the spy. The soldiers raise their spears and charge, but the swordsman deftly cuts off the spear tips in one fell swoop. Telling them he was joking, the man pulls an ID and presents himself as Chandler Namjak the young lord of Grasmere. The soldiers apologize, and the man tells them to get his weapon from his castle, handing them his seal as proof as they depart. Hidden in a nearby bush, No Name examines the man, and as he is about to depart, he hears a voice greeting him. The world fades to black, as a blue window pops up telling him the caster's understanding of skeletons from his previous life has reached the rank EX. No Name wakes up unarmored, unable to move, and staring at several blue windows. One informs him he is in a deep sleep and is dreaming, and within this dream his stats have decreased and his magic and field of vision have been suppressed, while another states he is under a powerful enchantment. As he checks his surroundings, he starts to move, and a blue window states that his stats are now 15% of what they were. As he stumbles forward, he sees another skeleton soldier which proceeds to fight him, until a window warns him his health is below 75%. No Name then reads his opponent's pattern and delivers a punch that sends him flying and then snaps his collarbone. The skeleton then recovers and reassembles before departing, and as No Name notices he has also recovered, an orc skeleton appears behind him. The orc sends him flying with a single punch and then raises No Name by his arm, shattering his humerus. No Name then gathers his severed arm and a blue window informs him that his level 5 sword mastery has been activated with a 70% effectiveness. He stabs the orc's skull with the arm, shattering it and killing the skeleton before healing once more. A stone then lights up as a sign tells No Name to choose what he wants from an assortment of shields and weapons, making the skeleton note that someone is watching over him. After he grabs a sword and shield, the stat debuff is lifted and his field division restored, revealing massive piles of bones. Three orc skeletons assemble and approach No Name. As he gauges the situation, one of them swings an axe at him, which he manages to block while thinking that if his skull cracks, he might see Rena again. But he shouldn't rely on miracles. After he loses his shield, the skeleton manages to evade the orc's axe blows, wondering what his captor wants. Although he wants to live, he realizes that there isn't any hope and wonders if this is just the end. And after kicking away his shield, the orc skeletons subdue him on the ground. He wonders why they don't just kill him, concluding that someone is controlling them and wondering who could be so powerful, as a woman watches from the distance. As the skeletons slam him to the ground, the woman asks him if he's hiding anything else, and No Name is soon surrounded by screaming spirits, as the voice keeps asking him questions. The skeleton hacks at the spirits as the questions continue, wondering if the voice is taunting him and demanding to know who she is. In response, as the spirits restrain him, the voice gives a series of cryptical analogies, with the last one being a clear reference to Rubia. No Name is angered at the apparent mockery, and the voice asks if he wants to rip her apart, before stating it is he who will end up that way. The voice states that she will break and reassemble him, adding bones from other creatures. This comment makes the skeleton realize that this must be a powerful being, and wondering if it knows about his ability to revive, asks why he was brought here. The spirits release him as the voice tells him that she wanted a friendly chat while she waited for someone. She states that after the digging up was done, some repairs were made, and she is done examining him, she would want to hear his story. Before answering, No Name asks about Rubia, and she answers that she saw images of her in his mind, 
asking how long it has been since he was resurrected. No Name then answers that it would be three months if measured by normal standards, and later yelling that this is his ninth life. Despite his many lives, he failed to protect or rescue anyone and is now being toyed with. Suddenly, a voice tells him the shout scared her, and No Name turns his head to see a part skeleton woman in red robes staring at him.